Now I'm happy to invite our, our final group to the stage, led by Dr. Patricia Lewis. Uh, as you know, the Research Director of International Security at Chatham House. Uh, next up, we have Ian Wallace, who is the co-director of the Cybersecurity Initiative at New America. After him, we have Dr. T.X. Hammes, who is a distinguished fellow at the Center for Strategic Research at NDU, the National Defense University. And right ne here next to Dr. Lewis, we have Paul Shari, who is Shari, who is a senior fellow and director of technology and the national security program at the Center for New American Security. So we, uh, we've had a great day, and, and now it's time to talk about what's, what, what, what's going forward. So Dr. Lewis, thanks so much. Thank you very much indeed, Frank. And um, thank you to everybody for still being here. Really, really <laughs> impressive. And um, it's, I thought the last session was absolutely fascinating. It's been such an interesting day. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go looking forward at the future of war. Um, and we have um, on the panel lots of techie people, including myself. Um, so a large part of what I think we're going to be talking about is technology and what impact that has and what future wars may look like. Um, so I'm going to turn, first of all, to you, TX and uh, get a few comments from you about what you think about future war, perhaps relate it back to 100 years ago, maybe just over 70 years ago, and, and compare. Yeah, um, boy, that's loud. Um, first off, I'm not really a techie person. I was a Marine infantry officer for 30 years, and I have a PhD in history. So that's technology techie. is not really a strong point. This morning you had the discussion about war. And I think the key thing to say is that war will remain a human activity, and therefore the nature, what it is at its heart, will never change. So it will be fog, friction, confusion, passion, chance, reason will all be there. What is changing is the character of war or how it is fought. And that's being driven by a couple of things, but primarily the fourth industrial revolution, which is what uh, Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum calls this convergence of technologies. And I think the first thing that's going to happen is the strategic situation will change as the world is in the process of deglobalizing. Because of robotics, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, you have destroyed the labor cost advantage. So manufacturers actually returning to the United States. Uh, didn't quite come out in the last presidential campaign, but in the last five years, we've gained a million manufacturing jobs in this country. We've gained a million. Last year, we had an inflow of $391 billion of foreign direct investment. 70% of that went to manufacturing. So we manufacture for ourselves now. We're pretty much energy independent because of the shale revolution. We've always been food independent. Services are coming back too because of AI, particularly Watson and type programs. So once you have all of those things back in the United States, there is a disengagement from the world. We essentially need less and less from the world. That is true, then you look at the military side, the fourth industrial revolution means small, smart, and many. I can make hundreds of thousands of smart, autonomous drones that hunt, and that changes things. And how this relates back to World War I, in World War I, we went in with this idea the offense will win, and then we encountered machine guns. Okay, military guys tend to be slow learners, because we saw this already in the US Civil War and in the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, so we now have, instead of machine gun bullets hunting you drones, and instead of not being able to move above the ground for about 8,000 yards direct fire artillery, it's now going to be ranging between 100 and 2,000 miles. So the defense gains an advantage, a tremendous advantage. So the problem here for the United States is if we have less interest in going out and it is going to be physically more costly to go out, how do we sustain global uh, alliances that have kept the peace since 1945. I'll leave it there. Great, thanks, Felix. Um, so what about, um, Ian, would you think that, would you agree that things are changing, or would you see them more as continuity from your perspective? So I, I don't disagree with anything that TX has said, and I think there's clearly extraordinary changes that are taking place in terms of the technology that's available. But I would point to sort of three sort of fundamental continuities um, from 1917. First of those, I think, is um, notwithstanding the sort of democratizing power of technology, and we often tend to think about the um, 
of technology giving opportunities to smaller states and non-state actors to cause uh, harm to, to bigger countries. Great power warfare is still something that we need to, to be concerned about. And the capacity of the new technology to destabilize some of the great power relationships um, that we have come to take for granted in some ways, and, and the ability of uh, sort of cyber uh, um, capabilities uh, to affect uh, nuclear communications and the space capabilities uh, on which they, they depend, I think ha has, has a real potential for, for, for destabilizing effects. Um, a second potential continuity from, from the period of the, the First World War is the fact that um, we shouldn't take for granted that entanglement and globalization um, will prevent great power warfare uh, from taking place. Um, the uh, new technologies um, clearly have created economies that are very integrated, um, but for reasons I've already said, um, they also pre present the opportunities for destabilization and for um, small mistakes to turn into uh, um, competition and uh, conflict that, that arguably no one is, is wanting to, to get. And Graham Allison has written recently about the Thucydides trap, and that, that, that may be something to explore. Um, third continuity is, um, and I speak as a, an Anglo-American, um, I think it is um, less and less true um, that the strategic uh, um, convergence that we saw after the um, First World War between um, uh, the United States and Europe can be taken for granted, particularly if the, the great power rivalry that we're most concerned about is actually focused on the Pacific. And I think that, to TX's point, has implications in terms of the, um, the, the way in which we think about how we keep the peace. Uh, and finally, one um, discontinuity that I think is worth putting on the table is um, that um, different to, to 1917, one of the impacts of the new technologies that, that we face is that the United States, I think, is likely to feel the effects on the homeland. Uh, and that, that, is, that can be in advance of a conflict, and we're sort of seeing some of the uh, attempts to sort of destabilize the political system in the, in the last uh, year or so, uh, but, but particularly once you get into a conflict, um, the US's natural adva geographical advantages in some ways being uh, impinged upon by the, the nature of the technology. We sort of saw that with nuclear threats, but, but now at a, a lower level as well. Paul, would you agree with, with these analyses? Would you see that technology is playing an increasingly important role in, in warfare, or is it playing much the same role as it always has done? So, so I disagree, right? It's too late in the day. We've been sitting here too long for us all to get up here yeah. and agree. <laughs> we'll all fall asleep. Um, you know, I think, um, I think Ian and TX both lay out some really significant ways in which we are seeing the character of warfare changing. Um, TX made this point about the distinction between the character of war, the means and methods of war, and the nature of war itself being chaotic and confusing. And, and I think that um, it's true that in the past, right, I mean, the character of war is always evolving, right? We've evolved from fighting with bows and arrows to spears and cannons and, and modern weapons today. And so we need to think about those things. I think there is good points. But you made this sort of statement, TX, about the nature of war never changed. Now, I think one could look back over history and say that um, the nature of war has never changed. That might be a fair thing. But for us to say, looking forward, that it will never change, to me, that's, a, that's making like a faith-based statement rather than a scientific one. Right? If the concept of the nature of war is to mean anything, then we ought to be able to envision circumstances in which it might change. And I could see some technologies on the horizon, you see glimmers of now, that could fundamentally alter humans' relationship of war itself. Right? I could see that in um, artificial intelligence, and not, not really near-term things, but in the long-term to be able to see things where um, the pace of battle changes in such a way where the speed and the flow of information is one that humans really cannot comprehend what's happening. 
And we reach some, the Chinese have used the term a battlefield singularity, where, where now we cross over into a domain where much of what happens in war is automated. It is done by machines. And humans set up this process, but then, then they have to step back. I could see that changing the nature of warfare in a very profound and fundamental way. I could also see similar things perhaps in, in biology, in synthetic biology, over time. So I think that's, that's something that's also worth looking at and exploring. So would you say, Paul, it's possible that you know, if, if we gave the decision making over to machines, full autonomy, that they would decide that war was pointless? That would be a positive outcome. <laughs> you know, if they're logical well, and smart yes, and... Yes, one could turn to science fiction to find many terrible <laughs> alternatives. I don't know, right? It just, it seems to me that um, it's possible to envision a world where um, machines play a role in warfare that is different than they ever have before. Machines have always been tools of humans in warfare um, as ways to, to hurt the enemy, to kill the enemy, to protect yourself. Um, but the, we have envision machines playing a cognitive role in warfare that is quite different. So if you look, for example, at stock trading today, right? Trades are not just executed by machines, but stock trading decisions are actually made by machines in, in you know, milliseconds. And they have interactions that really change the nature of what trading is today than what it was 20 years ago, uh, maybe 15 years ago, when you have people on the floor you know, at the New York Stock Exchange. And that, that has actually had profound consequences on stock trading and things like flash crashes, right? And, and risks in the financial sector. And, so, and for example, um, interference with GPS, which you know, we've seen recently. So you interfere with GPS, you interfere with the timing signals of all those financial transactions. Um, and you can do some very interesting things in a very small amount of time if you can fiddle the timing signals. I, right, would, right? I would like to push back a little bit. Yeah. What you were talking about was the character of war, machine by the machine and speed. What it doesn't change is passion, chance, and reason. Clausewitz's primary trinity. It will still be driven by passion. After 19, late 1914, early 1915, it is clear nobody's going to get anything out of the First World War. But you can't quit. There's so much lost blood. Passion takes over from reason. And we see this repeatedly. It is clear that Germany and Japan are losing the war by late 43, early 44. And yet passion won't let them quit. So unless you turn all of society over to machines, and that might be an option, you won't get that. The other thing is, what you're talking about is true artificial intelligence. What I'm talking about is task-specific artificial intelligence. Task-specific is good enough now that I can say to a drone, go to this area, look for these targets, and when you find one, feel free to kill it. Or I can tell it right back to me. I can tell it whatever I want to, but it's a limited parameter. It then doesn't decide, hmm, I don't want to do that. To get to that phase, you're in uh, true artificial intelligence, and that is when you get into the whole singularity discussion, and that's society changing, humanity changing. And that is a possibility, but as long as people remain in charge of war, it'll be fog, friction, and uncertainty, and passion will remain the primary driver once you start shooting at each other. Do you think it makes a difference when you say people? If I look back 100 years, it was men in charge. Do you think it makes a difference now that we have increasingly more women involved in decision making? I and mean, we've seen, for example, in Sweden, now we have a feminist foreign policy, a decision not to sell arms to Saudi Arabia based on that foreign policy. Uh, we have, in the UK, a human rights-based foreign policy. You know, we have uh, a number of countries around the world that have been thinking differently about how they would conduct themselves in times of crisis and conflict. And I'm wondering how much the decision-making process may change as we see more equality in the genders in society. I think that's a great, a great question, and that's a place where you could see um, the, the nature of at least international relations change, perhaps in a profound way, right? So, um, you know, on the battlefield, in terms of sort of shooting and maneuvering, that's likely to be the same whether there's, and there have been historically, of course, women over time in, in fighting roles in various ways and are still in many militaries today, right? But, but you know, this broader question of does that change international politics? as more women become involved. And I think the answer there is, it's really about whether um, international relations and politics, the, the culture dynamic also shifts, right? That if it becomes a one where there is still a sort of, uh, perhaps a, a masculine culture, right? Masculinity dominated sort of, sort of concept, then probably not, right? But if, if the culture itself changes, then yeah, perhaps in a major way. I'd like to say that's a fairly ahistorical statement. 
You think that's a Queen Bosha, Catherine Great, Golda Meir. But these were women operating in a masculine culture. So what I'm talking about is if you look at society. female dominated tribal societies in the past, they also fought and fought frequently and viciously. So to then there's a leap head obviously from tribal society to modern society. Sweden can do this because you know what? Nobody's going after Sweden. You'll notice that now that the Russians are more threatening, Sweden is getting very serious about defense. They're talking about going back to a draft-based army. They're doing some serious investment. They're making all the connections they can make. Because the reality remains, as long as the other side wants to kill you or take your stuff, you have to respond in a similar fashion. To think that if you put women in a room, they all cooperate, apparently you've never attended so a I'm, women's group meeting. So, can, I, can I say that I, I wasn't suggesting that? And to, to put it in that context suggests something um, rather different and odd. I th what I'm talking about is a shift in culture with decision making, where you move right. from a very masculine culture into one in which there's equal, more equal division of labor and decision making. So it's not moving to a room full of women. It's not a situation where you know women are a figurehead or have certain roles. And there's nothing to suggest in such a situation that anyone would not defend themselves. The question is, would you see warfare and perhaps the prompting of warfare change is the, is the question I have. So just to connect that part of the discussion with the, the earlier exchange between sort of Paul and TX, I think one characteristic of future decision making is, is that it's going to be heavily driven by under information driven by technology that we don't really understand. And so people, whether they're men or women, will be presented with information which uh, will be derived from analyses that, that come out of various algorithms or um, reach beyond sort of um, a, 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 a intuitive understanding of the, what is actually going on. And so whether it's men or women, part of that thing that's going to change in the nature of those decisions is how much confidence we have in our computers uh, and, and the, the sort of algorithms that go with them and, and how the ability of other people to change that technology. And I think in some ways that's going to be the shift in the nature of those discussions as much as the gender of the people sort of sitting Do you think it would affect the interpretation of information? Because that's a very important... I, I have no idea, and I think it's exactly the sort of question we should be asking ourselves, but I'm not sure I have the... I would say, again, personality-driven. Mm -hmm. No one would particularly accuse this administration of being a fact-driven administration. Uh, the Bush choice to go into uh, Iraq was certainly questionable. There were different types of information. Uh, the Japanese decision that they could take down the United States quickly. The German decision to go into Russia. There were facts, all that said, bad idea, really bad idea, and yet we went ahead because, again, this goes back to passion, chance, reason. Passion and the opportunity for chance, they think they can make a go of it. So while there will be this impact, certainly we're going to listen more to algorithms. It's also noted that the algorithmic programs have lost to the index stock markets. So people are pulling money out of many of these algorithm-driven trading systems and looking at index funds. A number of them have dried up because, again, if the algorithm isn't right, it just makes the same mistake really fast. Yeah, that happens sometimes. And people make a lot, some people make a lot of money hiring algorithms. It's not something that you can do from your laptop at Starbucks, but like, yeah, there are companies doing it. But you've got to be, you've got to be at the, at the cutting edge. Okay, so here's a question as well. We're talking about the future of warfare. We're talking about new technologies. We're talking about AI, cyber. We've got remote um, piloted aircraft dropping bombs. Um, which I think is a, is a very interesting topic, which I think we might get into in the Q&A. But we still have all the old stuff, right? People are still being killed with Kalashnikovs, mm -hmm. machetes, uh, crossbow recently we had fired into the Oval Cricket Ground in London. Um, we're still blowing up people with you know, very crude, improvised explosive devices. We just had one in the UK today. Um, we still have those big, dirty bombs that we should don't want anyone else to have called nuclear weapons. We're still ha seeing gas being used in, in uh, the Middle East, for example. So all these new technologies are just another layer on top. So one of the things that may happen, of course, is you have a separation, and this has happened throughout history, of capability. But it's and, not all. 
Mm -hmm. So how does that all factor in when you have all these smart new gadgets that can do so much and make mm -hmm. so many decisions and act so quickly? How does that all work with all the slower stuff and the older stuff and the clumsy big bang stuff? Again, it goes back to the fundamental nature of conflict. It's human driven. And if humans are motivated to hurt someone or kill someone, they'll find a way if it's a machete or a gasoline bomb. I would disagree. I think nuclear weapons are not bad. They have created a period of peace. If you look at the Cities trap, any discussion, rational discussion says, if you look at the United States and NATO and Warsaw Pact facing each other with autarkic societies that have very, very different beliefs in life, they should have fought. They definitely should have fought, and they didn't because of nukes. If you look at India and Pakistan, four big wars, both sides have nukes. The next time they go at it, the Pakistanis sneak a 1,000 guys 10 kilometers across the border and go, look at the great victory. And the Indians say, yeah, and we're going to kill every one of them. And then they do, but very methodically to make sure they don't start war. Russia versus China in the river war. Uh, core level operations against each other that should have triggered a major war. But both had nuclear weapons. And Mao, to make the point, detonated a weapon in the middle of the crisis. So I think that as bad as they are, if they're used, they have also created this period of peace. Now, proliferation is the question. TX, I'm going to challenge you on this. Okay. Because I've seen no evidence for this. I see a lot of post facto analysis with hindsight, interpreting people's, they should have fought, they didn't, therefore it must be nukes. They should have fought, they didn't, therefore it must be that must I see no hard attacking. evidence for this. And as a physicist, I think as historians, we should be demanding evidence for this. So, How would you find hard evidence that I didn't pull so the trigger? I think hard evidence would come in the form of documents and cabinet meetings, discussions about what actually made people stop. Since the end of the Cold War, we haven't seen any of that. And this is a big gap. Everyone's surprised. Where are these documents? Where are these discussions? So, so, so I would say if, if we're lucky, um, the conversations around the use of nuclear weapons will be as well informed and um, they're as they're rational as they have been in the past, and that's a pretty low bar. Um, but, but as we get new technologies, um, the risk for misunderstanding, misinterpretation, and frankly, cultural misunderstanding as, as, as we get sort of proliferation to parts of the world that, that necessarily we don't understand, if we're lucky and we avoid that sort of existential crisis, then technology will actually change the nature of sort of warfare below that level. And I think you know, demography and geography will force us into sort of um, fighting in cities and uh, um, areas that, that we you know, didn't in 1917, which um, brings in other sort of aspects of um, new technologies and other things. But I clearly, the prospect of nuclear war does change the way in which people think about these things. But I, my concern is that the, the, the new technologies that we're facing undermine some of the, the hard-fought stability that we, we've come to depend on. And I think we're going to have to work hard to, to, to maintain that. I mean, the other problem is, even if you buy the nuclear weapons, bring down the risk of conventional war, they do so at quite a devil's bargain that we now roll the dice of a cataclysmic war that could have existential consequences, right? Um, I think actually you've written a great report on um, nuclear near sort of use incidents, yeah. right? And accidents, and it's horrifying when you look at it, right? Yeah. So this, this idea that, you know, we'll, that um, our nuclear safety protocols are fail safe is um, quite, quite dangerous and, and probably wrong when you actually look at the details of things. And this idea that sort of cooler heads will always prevail is, is not really supported by the historical evidence because, like, there's some places where it just looks like it came down to luck and really not much or else. An, an individual's decision. I think that in doing this research, the thing that surprised us so much is how many times the decision to use was nearly made. So this is not accident. This is deliberate decision. Mm -hmm. And how many times, obviously, they weren't used because of an individual's decision not to often against all procedure and protocol, um, and at the risk of their own jobs, career, et cetera. Um, and, and this has given us a great deal of pause for thought about what, was, what we meant by deterrence, what we meant by stability during the Cold War and after, and whether or not we can rely on it 
today. And there are many ways to deter, right? And one of the important things, it seems to me, with deterrence, and this is being tried and tested at the moment, I think, in Northeast Asia, is the, un the belief in the willingness to use. So I'll leave that, with, that thought with you um, at the moment and go out into uh, everyone here for uh, their thoughts about the future of warfare and any questions or any points that you want to make. Um, so, please, if you could introduce yourself, it would be great as well. Thank you. Paul Eckert, uh, on the board of Alliance Francaise, as I mentioned this morning. Fascinating panel, thank you very much. I would go back to uh, the comment that, was, that you made, uh, TX, about Sweden. Uh, and the question I would like to ask is, uh, if we cannot eliminate scarcity, if we cannot eliminate competition for resources, if all people who wish to have a certain level of prosperity cannot necessarily simultaneously attain it, how could we hope for a, an elimination of war? Very good question. My position is, as long as there's people, we're going to try to kill each other. We got a couple million years of record on this, and it's not particularly indicative that we won't do this. Because very often, it's people with with all kinds of wealth that are going at each other that have already achieved that dream. I mean, Europe was more prosperous than it ever been, and people were doing better than it ever done when they decided to have World War One. I. I think that's right. I think human nature is in part the history of conflict and, uh, and warfare. So how do we factor that into our decision making, knowing that, as opposed to having some idea that some technology might prevent us from going to war? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't certainly think that um, we're likely to get in a place where sort of like we're able to just simply agree not to have war, in part because, you know, it only takes sort of one bad apple, right, to, to strip trouble for everyone else. Um, but I do think it's fair to say that um, while the nature of the international system is anarchy, that, that states make of that what they will, right? States choose to form alliances or not. They choose to form international agreements with economic cooperation or security agreements, or they choose not to. And, um, and I could see that many, like, because of many different factors, technological, human, others, those types of things changing over time as, the, as they have, right? And even the nature of um, the dominant human organizations changing. They are changing right now. We're seeing uh, corporate actors certainly becoming much more powerful over time, right? Multinationals that have very different kinds of interests. So um, while I don't know that it gets you to a place where we don't have war, that could certainly lead to the, the nature or context of war being perhaps different. Ian, yeah, so. uh, I don't have too much to add. I mean, I, I tend to agree with TX that sort of conflict is fundamental to human nature and um, in advanced societies, we have the tools to turn that conflict Control. into um, pretty terrifying um, uh, um, wars. Um, that isn't to say that we haven't developed the understanding and knowledge and reasoning to realize that often that turns out badly. Um, and then to Paul's point, therefore, think about sort of what we can do on the one hand to try and prevent that happening in, in ways that work against us, and when wars do happen, to constrain the ways in which they happen uh, so that we, um, the, the consequences of that is, is, is properly um, managed, for want of a better word. So if we, if, we look at human, if we just look at human nature now in terms of violence, so what we have seen over centuries is a decrease in war. And we've got an uptick at the moment, but if you look at the overall trends, there's a decrease in, in what we call war. So then the question I have, is there a decrease overall in human violence? And one measure for that is domestic violence. And domestic violence is a particularly interesting one because it's very hard. But we are starting to see, because of rules and regulations, a decrease in domestic violence because the penalties now for domestic violence are severe and real. I would say in some societies. Yes. And the yes. other thing is, when you look at Hoffman's work on the spikes, there's actually not a long-term decline. There's spikes yeah. in conflict. And there one are spikes, of the, but it is a slightly no, down. No, not actually. If you go back and look, I mean, World War II is the big spike. Um, 
in total deaths. Uh, so he's done some very interesting work on that, uh, kind of as an anti to the better angels work. I, I think it's so. So perhaps it's a, this is a, a technical thing, or perhaps it's a way that we're describing the issue. But I think when you look at deaths in terms of raw numbers, of course, it's the 20th century, the 27th, but as a fraction of the population, right? That's a much different kind of calculus, right? And so the fraction of the population is killed versus, say, in the 30s or 100 years ago. So um, there is this question, there is this clearly this broad term trend towards less violence. And um, I think you know, there's many different possible explanations. I am a little bit skeptical of the one that we're simply better humans. Um, I think one, one answer could be that the, um, the, the, the system um, the sort that's, that's interacting is one of larger components, so there's less um, surface area, if you will, between groups. So that when we have um, small tribes um, versus sort of large nation states, that you get a place where there are um, less opportunities for conflict, but then when they happen, they are much bloodier. The, the paradox in all of this seems to be that the technologies are allowing us to, when we do fight wars, kill each other at a scale that is simply unimaginable. We actually have the technology today to wipe humanity off the planet. This has been with nuclear weapons. And there are things in the future, in biology, for example, that could, be, could be even more, frankly. So that is um, just a, a huge, tremendous risk to me when we think about how we manage these technologies going forward. But the weapons we've been developing recently are the, in the opposite direction. Mm. The weapons we've been developing recently have been much more humanitarian weapons. They've been, you know, uh, fewer people killed by accident, uh, they've been target, tar more targetable, more accurate, uh, f less explosive power. The trends in advanced weapon technology is to reduce loss of life, not to increase it. I would say that the Russians are going a different direction. With their thermal barrack warheads and things like that, they are definitely going in a, in a different direction. I would agree that we've tried for more precision. The biology is the piece that worries me. The other thing that worries me is you mentioned the big states were able to kind of impose peace on large parts of the world. As it becomes more and more technology available, smaller powers, and the cost gets very high, then are we willing to do that anymore? The other problem I have is a lot of the peace that's been imposed since 45 has been based on these international organizations, NATO, the, the alliances we have in, in Asia, that have the combined power to do this. If America starts to withdraw from that, and I think on the pattern we're on with buying ever more expensive and frankly less useful weapons like the F-35 and the super carrier, Americans will get tired of bearing the burden and will say, we're done. What we have to do is figure out a way we can sustain these alliances for less money. Now technology can be a massive help here if we're willing to invest in it, but our entire military industrial political const construct is opposed to that for very good reason and legitimate reasons for the people involved. So that's the big nug we've got to get over, I think, for the United States. Yeah. Um, to make the point that when we think about technology changing warfare, we don't just need to think in terms of um, sort of military hardware. I and mean, one of the big shifts that has sort of changed the nature of society in the 20th, 20th century has been advances in healthcare. Uh, a lot of that, which on the one hand has changed um, warfare itself and the impact of you know, getting shot, getting blown up. But it's also changed society in that people have had smaller families and people's willingness to you know, put their um, uh, families at risk sort of changes and that, that drives people thinking about uh, risk taking and, and the way in which they, they go about warfare. So, so I think you know, that there have been this sort of trend towards sort of precision or what have you. But, but I don't think we can necessarily take that for granted um, and that um, other, other societies, other people who care less about um, sort of d democratic systems will quite easily come to different calculations around some of those things. I also think that while the trends that you're describing are very real in terms of greater precision and the ability to reduce civilian casualties, I see those as very culturally dependent applications of the technology by Western societies who care about those things. And I could certainly envision other societies today that don't, or war as a whole transition into some place where people don't care, right? Like the, 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 the nature of war, if you will, over time has been that many times wars have been waged against, directly against civilian populations, right? In fact, the United States did in World War II, right? So, so that's not, you know, that's, this is, I think, probably a, a unique and positive period in terms of how we but your point on biology is the one that worries me. 
if synthetic biology progresses the way it's going, and I can see an accidental release of someone thinks they're trying to create something good and, and create something really bad, because there's a lot of basement labs today, then do you end up with a war on the society? Do you say, okay, you killed 30 million Americans are dead because of what was released out of this country. I can't find the guy. So the only way to make the message to all the people running labs around the world is to flatten the country. You can see that kind of a reaction. I mean, that historically, that's how populations respond to massive casualties in the homeland. Don't care what it takes, get rid of the other guy. But if you have that many people are killed, won't everyone be too sick? No, it depends. I mean, you look at the 1918 flu, it swept through and then uh, a couple of weeks afterwards, after it burned through the over population. Two years, over two yeah. years. Yeah. But again, there's that eight month period as the concentrated period. And in an individual community, it burns through in a matter of a few weeks and then they're on their feet. And we were still fighting World War I, and there wasn't a significantly reduced capacity to fight World War I, despite the huge casualties. And remember, again, today, if I want to flatten a country, I don't need many people. I need some launch teams. I need one nuclear boat that's been at sea and nobody has it. And I can take most countries out. So the issue of attribution is increasingly a problem. You mentioned the biotech side and working out whether or not it's a, an accidental release, a deliberate release, who could have done it. But the same is true, isn't it, uh, with cyber attacks. And we're seeing an increasing number of cyber attacks, <laughs> which I think those of us who work in these things imagine that these things will become part of war. Some people that imagine it will just be cyber, cyber war, but no, I think it's clear it will be just another weapon of war. And we're seeing increasing attacks on the critical infrastructure. We're also seeing attacks on our ways of thinking and our ways of, of organizing ourselves. Um, but attribution in these things is very difficult. And we all know um, that there have been a number of instances where the wrong attribution has been made, but nobody knows that in the public domain. People still imagine it was the ones that they first said, right? So the, the possibility for mistake, for the reaction to then hit the wrong person and set up another cascade of all sorts of big problems is, is, is uh, huge. So Ian, And we've got historical you? precedent, the Spanish-American War. Yep. They didn't blow up the main, we did. Yep. So we should have attacked the US Navy, not, not the Cubans. Ian? So, so um, what you say is clearly correct um, in, in the sense that um, the opportunity for misunderstanding is significant and the consequences of those misunderstanding are potentially catastrophic. Misinterpretation, yeah. w w What I would also say, though, is there is a difference between sort of technical attribution and political attribution. And certainly the sort of historical trend to date may change over time, is that certainly in relation to sort of cyber capabilities, um, every time we've seen a sort of significant use of cyber capabilities, it has been the context of a, a bigger conflict, where it is and with the other um, sources of information that we've had available, it has been relatively easy to situate that within the wider context. Now, that could easily lull us into a false sense of security, it introduced the opportunity of sort of false flag attacks and, and what have you. But I think we also oughtn't to let our imaginations run too wild that um, these instances of, of conflict often um, operate in a, in a wider context. And it's important, I guess, um, if there's a lesson to, to make sure that we continue to um, keep our understanding of the wider context in mind uh, as we ob observe these um, uh, sort of specific uh, uses of technology. This is also the, the public attribution. And what the government, well, it's very well quite understands quite well on their own, but they don't want to reveal public attribution. Any other questions that people might have? Follow the money. Follow the money. Apologies that this came up, because I was in and out there for a moment, but has, has the question of non-state actors come up? Um, at all. And a little bit, and well, beyond ISIS, which I think is an, an obvious one, are there other non-state actors that uh, used to be playing an increasing role going forward? But if this question has been answered, then, yeah. then somebody else, please. <laughs> no. This is probably the scariest thing, is a non-state actor 
very small non-state actor, very small group could have massive impact. It would not be that difficult to take out 10 airliners parked uh, at a terminal. You can look at the airline schedule and say, okay, we're gonna be loading eight 380s and two 747s, two 777s at Heathrow during this 30 minute window. And we certainly have cheap drones that now are very close to autonomous that could deliver a charge to that. Now, an explosive charge that large, the entire device would be about that large. It's 30 grams of high explosives and about a half ounce of copper will punch through an airplane, no problem. And then you get a secondary off the fuel. So that's an option for a very, very small group. For a better funded group, there are now autonomous drones that can fly 2,000 miles that are vertical launch. They're launched out of the back of a pickup truck. So if I am whatever comes after ISIS and want to stop American presence in Iraq, do I take out airliners in Kuwait and tell the Kuwaitis, if you don't stop the Americans flowing through, I'm gonna to continue to kill your airliners. So we spool up and we defend Kuwait. And then we say, okay, same message to Saudi Arabia, Italy, Germany, United Kingdom, et cetera. It allows small entities to reach out very, very long distances. And the defense, the expense of defending against that's high. That's why I think there's gonna be a greater reluctance on the part of the Americans to say we wanna get involved. Because the payback could be in in Charleston Harbor. In fact, there are now these little drones uh, that are in the water that can spend five years at sea. Well, that's a self-deploying sea mine. It may take me two years to get there, but I'm gonna get Charleston Harbor, or I'm gonna put a, a tanker down in Houston, something like that, and that's the trade-off. Yes, you can keep bombing my villages, and eventually I'm gonna blow up a ship in your harbor. Do you wanna continue to play this game? Ian. That is clearly a concern, and there are, there are other technologies that you can also imagine in the hands of non-state actors. What I would also say, however, I think it, it, it's beginning to become clear to s states across the world that um, it, in, in certain technological areas, the risks are so great that working together to raise the, um, the, the floor is, is an increasing priority. So in the area of sort of cyber capabilities, investing in technology, working across um, international boundaries so that if we don't necessarily stop conflict between states, we can at least make it more difficult for non-state actors to, to, to be really damaging. It is becoming um, part of the conversation in ways that it hasn't really previously. And uh, the other side of that is sort of responsible state behavior that that notwithstanding the, the opportunities for non-state access to, to do bad things without anyone knowing about it, um, increasingly it will be harder for, um, part because of the technology for, for, for people to um, always evade sort of uh, states. But the key is I want you to know about it. I mean, you're using your drones to kill my people in the Middle East. I'm gonna use my drones to kill your people in Europe. That's a fair trade. Now the question is, at what point does your, political, does your political gain, and will your population continue to support this? I mean, if I'm a strategist for a small group that's trying to change things, mostly what I want is the West out. Let me have this fight internally. And these will be very, very long fights, because I think what we're seeing in the Middle East is state, is not state formation, but nation formation. State formation forming a government takes a long time, but nation formation, creating a population with common language, common beliefs, et cetera, in the European and, and uh, Asian experience, it's 400 to 1,000 years. So if we're 10 times faster, Syria will sort itself in about 30 years because they've been at it for 10 years. What do you want to do in Syria that lasts 30 years? Particularly if they start plinking airplanes in different parts of the world. And that's going to be the key. I think the key power for small states will be break the will of the external power. So what would you do about it? Well, I think we're, we're working very hard on what's good cheap drone defense, how do we figure it out? You can't restrict drones because there's so much demand. I mean, the real problem is going to be Amazon is gonna get their fully autonomous, non-GPS reliant drone that'll take 20 pounds, 100 miles. And that is gonna be a real problem because it'll be available. 3D printing will mean you can probably print the damn thing. So you keep telling us all these chilling things, but what, what would you do about it? Well, what I'd do is stop spending on the F-35. 
That is a huge sump of money. Stop buying carriers. If we don't buy another carrier after the JFK is commissioned, we will have carriers through 2065. Trash the B-21 bomber. We have a disagreement on this. But there are ways to reach out those distances that don't cost so much money and start looking at how you defend against these types of things. And it may be the defense against a drone swarm is a drone swarm. I mean, training an eagle to get a drone is fine. The eagle gets tired, it hits the first drone, who gets the next nine? So you've got to have counter drone ribbons. tribe swarm. Ribbons. And, yeah, yeah, there, yeah, ribbons. There's ways to Down do runs. this. Yeah. Uh, the question is, are you willing to invest in it? And the answer right now is no. We have a military industrial complex that likes stuff we used to make, and we want to make more of the stuff we used to make. It's interesting, uh, air power as it currently exists and sea power as it currently exists and has done has been around about 100 years. Now, the longbow had a 100-year application against the French, but that's because the French never learned. But most weapon systems in recent times, 100 years is an extraordinarily long in a tooth weapon system. And yet, that's what we invest in. Oh, no, just let Paul speak, because he's, he's deserving a turn. I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the, to your question about um, non-state actors, I think there's like two dimensions to think about this problem. One is the, um, the, the access that smaller actors have to technology, whether they're terrorists or some other group, right? And some technology is making it easier or harder and trying to do some of the things that Ian was talking about, trying to sort of raise the bar, if you will, right, of our defenses so that, um, sure, maybe Russia can hack into your systems, but not just uh, any old uh, Yahoo who's, who's got some bad ideas, right? Um, but then there's this other dimension entirely to very powerful actors, um, corporate actors, who, have, who are creating this technology, right? Mm -hmm. Who are major players in these national security conversations. If you're gonna talk about um, national security in the context of encryption, or surveillance, or artificial intelligence, or fake news, and the role of you know, social media, and, and algorithm, Facebook's news feed, and Twitter, these companies are, you know, they control the ecosystem. Right, in which these things are happening, they're major players. And so I think there's really a need to have um, more dialogue between governments and companies to try to understand these challenges, to try to make sure that we're you know, thinking about all these different equities of different players um, to, to, to really come up with sort of you know, relevant national security solutions. Ian. So yes, uh, I was just gonna come on sort of Texas point, but if, if the question is about non-state actors, then to a certain extent, it's building the coalition of states to um, work to build a framework in which those non-state actors have less freedom of maneuver, and that's clearly uh, extremely challenging. And, but it's also extremely challenging because you risk playing into um, this uh, in the hands of the authoritarian states who you know, have a vested interest in preservation of you know, what they have neatly termed the sort of Westphalian model turned it to their advantage. But, but ultimately, it, you know, even the private sector companies exist within frameworks of rule of law, which you know, depend on um, governments and sort of international relationships that, that mean that, that some version of that framework is, is an important part, and making sure those international relationships um, serve that greater purpose is, is, is what we need to focus on. Your point about the corporations is absolutely vital. Today, or was yesterday in the paper, Google is boosting AI research in China massively. Now, we know that if you're doing AI research in China, you have to turn the results over to the Chinese government or you don't operate in China. People are speculating that AI may be the single most important weapon system of the next generation. So we are standing by as Google dumps huge amounts of money into the future of the Chinese military. It's an interesting approach. We should at least debate it. Any comments on this? No, we haven't finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> he has. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are there any other questions that people might have? Or, um, yeah? You think we should finish up now, Megan? Yeah, please. Yeah. The, uh, sorry, the, the, the connection between uh, information and the media environment and the future of war. Um, specifically, we have 
you know, Twitter being used by policymakers, which is sort of the equivalent of high-speed trading for, for decision-making, which can create responses that are unpredictable and sudden or inflammatory or have other unforeseeable consequences. And then this connects to the more specific question of uh, how do you see the role of um, Russia in some of these questions? Um, Russia is very involved in the management of information, public opinion, and takes the position, for example, concerning Crimea that uh, the, the territory is purely Russian territory. So I'm just curious about your thoughts on the connection between information and the future of war. I mean, I think that's a great question. I think, you know, we've seen in the last 10 years, and it's really just the, the blink of an eye, a technology come along in social media that is as transformative in terms of how we think about information as the printing press. And I think I mean, we're only beginning to try to understand as a society, what does that mean? What does it mean when everyone has a megaphone, right? One thing, you know, some of the things that we're starting to see early on is like, okay, all of the conversation drifts to the extremes. Right? When I look at my news feed and my Twitter feed, all I see is the craziest people in our country. Right? And like, oh, this whoa, whoa, whoa. this thing, and now everyone's reacting, and there's outrage, and like, it seems to me probably no way to, run, to have a civilized society, but, but we're struggling through these things, right? How do we, and so there's both, there's all these interesting technology channels. Everyone has access to information, everyone has access to a voice, but also what information you get is controlled by algorithms, controlled by these companies, and we don't really understand, I mean, they understand, I don't understand. We don't understand what's behind that, what's driving me getting this news versus that. And they certainly don't understand yet how their algorithms are affecting the broader policy debates, right? So um, if we think that influences things like our elections, it's certainly gonna influence foreign policy and decision making, um, mm -hmm. I think in, in really profound and transformative ways that we're just grappling with now. I think you're spot on there, but it was kind of out there calling the president one of the craziest. Yeah. <laughs> um, but your question about Russia and Crimea, this again gets into the whole history of a culture in an area. I mean, the Russians have a legitimate argument until 1956 this was Russia. And then they arbitrarily moved the boundary. So why can't the same government arbitrarily move the boundary, arbitrarily move the boundary back? I mean, that's certainly at least an argument that can be made. You may not agree with it or not, but particularly given that the majority of the people in there are Russian and would rather be Russian. In fact, they were kind of upset when they were told they were no longer Russian. So, but we've got that all over the world. And this again, part of this nation formation versus uh, state formation and the breakup of empires throughout history has always led to this. Now, when the Ottoman Empire broke up, we froze it by the artificial separations and delineations. And so the key question is gonna be, how do we, how do we manage that? Particularly now with the information, uh, trying to find out what is actually a fact is gonna get really sporty. Well, I think you make this great point that um, war is ultimately about identity, right? There has to be an us versus them in war. And these identities are created identities over time that leaders use and manipulate for gain to create sort of nationalist slogans and, and, and songs and banners. And um, now we're in a world where anyone can begin to shape that identity. Anyone can create a hashtag. I think you've heard of that. Movement. And so what does that mean for um, these, I, these definitions of us versus them? How does that shape? Um, who gets to decide what identities are relevant in war? But, but think about it the other way, Paul. You know, if, if it's about identity and essentially about fear and fear of the other and fear of the stranger, we can change that. Right? We can use these technologies to change that. We know from genetics that there is no other. Right? We're all mongrels. We're all a big mix. We're all a mm -hmm. bit of that here and a bit of that there. And um, it's... This is important knowledge. And how do we get this out to people to understand that there is no other and we shouldn't have those fears? There are people who behave badly. We should certainly deal with them. But that's about behavior, not about what tribe they belong to, what country they belong to. How do we use this technology? How do we spin it back in a way that it becomes technology more for good than for, for well, ill? Frankly, Which is what, how we used yeah. to think of it, remember? It was a fantastic but enabling But isn't that what the Chinese are worried about? Isn't that exactly what they're too I know a lot of is. great Chinese people. No, Chinese, the Chinese <laughs> government. Right, okay. The Chinese government is working very, very hard to segment the internet, and they've been pretty successful. And then using the internet as a control mechanism with this social score they're using is truly Orwellian uh, because it leads to self-censorship. 
you're not sure where the line is, but you know if you step over the line, you got real problems. So you tend to back up from the line. Then line actually starts to retract. So I think the different ways different societies use them are a very interesting experiment. China's using it for control and to reinforce the identity. And we seem to be, because it's totally free use, we're getting a fragmentation of identities. Well, maybe. I mean, I would say that in China, what we are seeing is that people, particularly younger people, are finding ways around the system. And they're not being so controlled as the Chinese government fondly imagines. We've seen that throughout the Middle East. Uh, you know, you go to Saudi Arabia, if you don't know the first thing about these technologies and you go online, there's, you suddenly can't access most of your websites in Saudi Arabia because they might show something the government doesn't want you to know. But of course, if you know how to cloak your identity, how to use different ways through, and you can find um, clever other people who can connect you to different networks, you can look at all of that stuff. And that's what younger people are doing. Please. Have a microphone. So um, we certainly may be of the same <coughs> genetic makeup, but uh, how do you respond or what would you do about those who use or rather misuse religion to create these differences and fanaticism which can lead to these, in fact, to the start of war? Uh, now that's an age old question. Who wants to talk about Well, religion? again, I mean, religion is just another version of us versus them. Yeah except, uh, and much like the identity, ethnic identities, um, if you're Irish, you can't trust those damn English. Uh, and if you were English, you didn't trust the Irish for a long time. So this is just one more way, one more artificial construct that's much like ethnicity is not, I mean, to a certain degree with language and stuff, but languages separate people, cultures, and religion is part of culture. So we're not going to stop that. Um, I think what you'll see, we hope we'll see a reformation in Islam. There's certainly this is a struggle within Islam about what Islam means. And we're beginning to see some movement on that front. But remember, uh, it took us a couple hundred years in Europe to work our way through this. The Thirty Years War was the tail end of the Hundred Years War. We got a lot of help from the Black Plague a couple of times. And then we had another couple hundred years of war. And then we kind of worked it out. Well, sort of until the Bosnian thing came up. So the idea that people will get over this is, is wildly optimistic. And I think that's why you really need to focus, as you said, on the structures and systems to try to tamp this down. Because the one thing that has been successful in, like you said, reducing violence, it's been in organized parts of the world. I don't think you can make that statement about large parts of Africa, because nobody knows what's happening in most of the Congo. They're, you know, they say deaths are down. Well, nobody knows, because there's nobody out there to report. Uh, and it doesn't make its way back. So you've got to try to expand that structure into whatever's acceptable for that part of the world to tamp down. It won't eliminate, but you try to control it. Actually, pe people do know what's going on around the world. Um, there are people, at non-governmental organizations, the United Nations, um, other international organizations that are working in all sorts of parts of the world, and they have information that they do transmit back, journalists and so on. Yes, we, we can actually put a picture together of what is happening in the world and really try to understand what's going on. Ian. And, and that information itself is part of the system I think TX is talking about. It, the technology is not going to prevent conflict um, and it's, it's you know, um, definitely not going to make everybody sort of like each other. Um, the, the, that competition, as we've discussed, is sort of fundamental to the human condition. But um, what, what I think we can and should be seeking to do is stopping those conflicts kill hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Uh, and uh, at some level, um, the sort of contained nature of conflicts uh, that we've seen relative to what we could imagine, given the, the, the weaponry that's available, um, it is you know, success. Positive uh, and, and, and But that's not to say that we should rest on our laurels. And I think one of the tricks going forward is to turn that technology to, to maintain that lid rather than to, to um, uh, loosen the, the bolts that's holding it down. Right, so it's Friday. We're about to close. I want one positive prediction <laughs> about the future and the future of preventing conflict from each of you. Paul, I'll start with you. Oh, wow. You're a very positive guy. Um, okay. Um, I, what's, um, what's encouraging about the future? Um, I, I guess I, I, 
I still am encouraged by the idea that much of this technology is very democratizing in the sense that it gives people a voice, right? It seems like we were at early stages of um, grappling with what that means and, and how we manage the fact that everyone has a voice, but it seems to me that in the long run, the fact that we have access to more information, that more people have the ability to speak their mind, um, ought to be for the, for the better good of humanity. It's just, there may be some, some growing pains along the way. TX. I would think this whole fourth industrial revolution is gonna bring tremendous amounts of good things to a huge part of the population. Africa may be able to skip the whole factory phase like they skipped the cell phone, they would write cell phones. You won't need big plants. You use small 3D printing local production. I think there will be a great dissemination of both wealth and ideas and creativity there. The key thing is can we keep a lid on the negative aspects of that? And we, that requires- Just positives now, okay. That requires the states to do it, and I think we can, Great. but we're challenged. Uh, so I think the, the positive note that I would offer is we, we do know our history, and in some ways the technology helps us know our history better. The fact that we can sit down and discuss um, the new technology in the context of what has gone before, and that causes us pause to think about what could happen in the future, is, is probably the thing that's m most likely to, to put us in the right mindset to prevent very bad things happening in the future. Great. So it's my job to wrap up, and I'm going to wrap up on a positive note. Um, first of all, I'm going to say what a great day it's been. I think it really has. Um, I've learned so much. I've really enjoyed listening to everybody who's spoken both on this um, raised platform and also um, within the room. Um, I've learned a, a great deal about beginnings of war, but I think I've learned more about how we go for forward. And, um, you know, we've been delighted to work uh, with Meridian and um, with the Lansbury Foundation on this project. And our next meeting will be taking place in London. And the way we're going to go forward is to put our faith in the next generation. Because I don't know about you, but I find this next generation, people now in their sort of mid-20s to mid-30s, absolutely incredible. They're really smart, they're so connected, they really understand what's going on in the world. Um, they read so much, they've got ideas, they're turning out to vote, you know? Um, my, the generation that preceded them often didn't bother. <laughs> and I'm just absolutely, what we would say in Britain, stoked by these, these guys. So we're going to hold a meeting uh, in the early part of next year in which we are going to talk with the younger generation about learning the lessons from the mistakes that their <laughs> ancestors have made, us in other words, and how they can make sure going forward that they sort of learn the lessons from what we did, both good and bad, and uh, make sure that they have the vision of how to prevent world war from ever happening again. So with that, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank our panelists for being such good sports and for doing uh, such a, a great job. And Megan and, and Frank, if I can thank you again for all the hard work and all of your team. Um, brilliant. Thank you.